I have to admit today, if you don't like technology, if you're one of those people that say, oh, I hate those smartphones and computers, I don't want to hear, you're in for a bad time, <laughs> OK? Because we're going to talk about not today's cutting edge technology, but tomorrow's cutting edge technology. And hopefully, I will turn your world upside down a little bit, make you think a lot. And if you come out of here with your head spinning, I've done my job. And if you think you came out of here understanding everything I'm talking about, you're wrong. <laughs> OK? So first of all, I'd like to thank, thank uh, William and the Collegiate Peaks uh, Forum Series for inviting me. It's, it's really great. Uh, it was not really hard. They didn't have to twist my arm to come in Colorado and in the beautiful mountains. It's really a nice, really nice community, really gorgeous, gorgeous place. I'm a little bit jealous that I'm just staying for three days, but I guess I'll have to come back next. So, today we're going to talk about quantum technology. And I have taken that opportunity to actually do a brand new talk. So, which means that I'm going in cold. I have no idea how long it's going to take. So, in 20 minutes, we can be out of here, or we can still be talking around midnight. <laughs> so, I'll try to keep it short, but you never know. I might go on a limb and then just start babbling by myself. You know, feel free to tell me to shut up, but uh, hopefully I'll entertain you enough. So, before, what, let me get started. before we get started on what quantum mechanics is, what quantum technologies are, let's go back a little bit and see the importance of studying nature and studying the things that surround us, the importance it's had in the, on mankind. Okay? There's two things that humans intrinsically are. Well, more than two things, but two of them that I'm really interested in. Humans are very curious. Why? I don't know, but we're curious. We're always trying to wonder, you know, we're always asking what's going on. And also humans are lazy. We always try to find better ways to make our life easier. Well, you can call it crafty, but I call it lazy. Well, we try to make our life easier. And, and, and turns out that actually understanding and harnessing the world around us had had huge impact on humankind. Right? We can think, for example, of fire. When, we, when the humans have been able to control fire, to use fire, then it had a profound impact. We were able to build tools. And we went from nomadic people to sedentary people with agriculture. Harnessing steam. Right? Steam, we were able to build engines. We, that was the Industrial Revolution. We had tools that was building tools. So we didn't have to, you know, to heat up metals and then do the tools ourselves. We have tools that have done that, and we can just go in our lazy boy and, and you know, enjoy life. Electromagnetic, electromagnetism, light, right? Cell phones, satellite communication completely changed the world. I can see that most of you here have seen a world where internet did not exist. <laughs> Hey, that's okay. I, I remember when I was young, there was no internet. So I, I don't mean anything by this. Okay? But we, we all seen how internet has changed everything in the past 15 years. So now we're on to one of the last phenomenon of nature that hasn't been quite harnessed yet, and that's quantum mechanics. If you know what quantum mechanics is, great. If you don't know, Hold on a second, I'm going to well, try to explain what it is. But this is essentially what quantum technologies are. We're trying to build technologies based on quantum mechanics. So before I start talking about quantum mechanics, I'm going to talk about classical physics, because I'm going to use that over and over, quantum versus classical. What we refer as classical physics is essentially the world that we experience. It's our everyday life. Those are the science that was given to us by Newton, Galileo, Maxwell, like how the planet goes around the solar system, how if I push my car, how it pushed back on me, how we put a man on the moon, and, and so on and so forth, like our everyday experience. This world is predictable. You give me enough information about it, I can predict exactly what's going to happen in the future. There's no uncertainty. There's nothing weird. It's very well understood, well behaved. 
Quantum mechanics refers to the, part, to the behavior of the building blocks of nature. Atoms, molecules, elementary particles. You might have heard the Higgs boson talked about a lot lately. No, the electrons and so on, even like small electrical circuits. Turns out, if we try to explain how an atom behaves, how the electron hangs around the nuclei of an atom, using the laws of classical physics, it completely fell. Not fails a little bit, it flat out fails. It does not work. Actually, you can, that's an exercise we do in university. It's a back of the envelope calculation. What if the electron behaved cl you know, classically? Turns out the whole universe will collapse at about five nanoseconds. The oh. universe has been around for a few more nanoseconds than this, right? It's been around for billions of years, so we know classical physics is not the real deal. So quantum mechanics is the rules that explain how atoms, molecules behave. And those rules are completely different than everything we experience in our everyday life. So I'm going to attempt <laughs> to give the quickest introduction to quantum mechanics possible. First of all, one thing I have to say is after I'm done, I'm done at this slide or I'm done at my talk tonight, if you think that you can explain quantum mechanics using your experience, using plain language, you're wrong. <laughs> quantum mechanics lives outside our experience. It's something that we cannot relate to, but it's something that we know it's true because we go in the lab, we do experiments, we measure it, and it's always right. Quantum mechanics is arguably the most precise theory ever devised by humans. Every attempt at proving it wrong failed. The Higgs boson experiment at CERN, $10 billion, and it succeeded. So that was a big effort, and yet again, quantum mechanics is right. I personally work on an experiment for two years to disprove quantum mechanics, and I fail bad, <laughs> which is a good thing, because it proved that it, it, it works well. Okay, so what are those phenomena that are new? Rule number one is what we call the superposition principle. In quantum mechanics, if you have a quantum system, a photon, <coughs> particle of light, an electron, a nuclei, a molecule, an atom, I can put it in two one of them, I can put it in two states that are contradictory. I can take a particle, one particle of light and put it here and there simultaneously. Now, if you try to convince me that you can do that with your cat at home, I don't believe you. <laughs> but there is such a thing as Schrodinger's cat. That was when Schrodinger, one of the, uh, no, the father of quantum mechanics, the theory, was, the theory was saying that I can be in two places at once. And he came and was like, well, then I can have my cat who's both dead and alive at the same time. Well, of course not. Your cat is not quantum mechanical. It's too big. But an electron can be both here and there. <laughs> take it, okay? That's, that's the way it is. Rule number two. The uncertainty principle says that rule number one works as long as you don't look. <laughs> and by looking here, we mean any type of action of measuring, trying to acquire information on the system. Because if I say, okay, I have, okay, I'm taking my one photon and I put it at two boxes at once. And then you look at me and I'm like, eh, I don't believe you. You're going to go look to the right box. It's there. It's like, yeah, it was there all the time. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it exactly the same way. Now you say, well, I know it's in the right box. So you go look at it, it's not there. It's in the other one. And then I can do that over and over, and sometimes it will be there, sometimes it will be there. But that's the thing with quantum mechanics, is there's no way whatsoever we can predict where it's going to be. So quantum mechanics is a world of uncertainty. It's a world of probability. It's things that cannot be predicted precisely. So of course quantum mechanics is it's more complicated than this. 
But that gives you the flavor of what it is. Also, the uncertainty principle, you can also say that if you try to measure a quantum system, you will perturb it no matter what. And then we'll see what we can do with that a little later. I'll give you an, an, an example of an experiment that we can do in the lab. Now, it looks like a cartoon, but we can build that in the lab. I'm going to use a laser, a fancy laser. It's a laser that sends one particle of light at a time. Right now, when I take my laser like this, whoop, this is like billions and billions of photons. But we can have lasers that send one photon at a time. I'm going to send it on what we call a 50-50 beam splitter, which is really a half silver mirror. Okay? Half the time, the photon will go through. Half the time, it will be reflected. It really looks like this. like It's a piece of glass that half the light goes through, the other half. So, and then I'll put some detectors. Now what I will do is I will send photon, and I will look at where they appear. So if I do that many times, half the time, they will be on the bottom detector. Half the time would be at the other, at the top detector. Well, nothing surprising. That's what a beam splitter do. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two beam splitter right after the other. Okay, here is just mirrors, so I'm going to bounce back the light, and I'm going to put them again through another beam splitter, the exact same one or similar, and then I'm going to look at the statistics. So if you look at it a little bit, I have a photon. Then here, I have half and half chance. So let's say it goes down this path. And then arrive here. I have half and half chance of bouncing there or going there. So 25% of the time, it will end up here. 25% of the time, it will end up there. Then if I look at the path where it goes up, then 25% of the time goes here. 25% of the time goes there. So convincing enough that I should see half the time here and half the time there? Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good. Wrong. <laughs> this is what we see in the lab. If I do it in the lab, I will get my photons always at the top. So this is an example of how thinking classically leads to wrong things when we work with quantum mechanical object. Ha, huh. that's the reaction I'm looking for. Why? Well, without going into too much detail, is in quantum mechanics, we don't work with probability, but we work with probability amplitudes, which you can think of it a little bit as probability with minus sign. I won't go into details. But the, the whole point here is the probability amplitude of taking this path here versus taking that path there is negative of each other. So they cancel out. That's something that classically does not exist. Because if you have a probability of doing something, it's always going to be there. There's no such thing as a negative probability. It's always positive. This is what we call interference. And that's something else that is very unique to quantum mechanics. Actually, to wave mechanics, but we won't get into the details of, of things. So that's an example of something I can go in the lab. Actually, this, this is a real Max Zender interferometer build. You see that it's the laser here, and then now it just bounced back. But there's one beam splitter there, one beam splitter there, your two detectors. You go in the lab, and then you see that all the lights end up always at the same detector. Here's a cartoon. There should not, you know, the laser goes at both places, but that was drawn by a high school student. Didn't know any better. <laughs> they don't know quantum mechanics yet, which we're trying hard to bring quantum mechanics to high school. But. Uh, then I'll pass. Okay, so now you're experts in quantum mechanics. You understand everything. It's clear to you. You have an intuition. Good. Let's see what we can do with that. But first of all, I talked about quantum technologies as the technology of tomorrow. But it, it's, it's, I was a bit overselling it. Quantum technology has been around us for 50 years or more. The laser. That laser pointer here, that works because of quantum mechanics. Okay. If the world was not quantum mechanical, the laser would not exist. The laser works because we, we've been able to build it because for once we're able to understand how light and matter interacted, and then we're able to control the type of light that is emitted once we you know, put an electric current through a gas and so on and so forth. LEDs have been popping up more and more for the past 10 years. I'm pretty sure your TV 
unless you have one of those big things. If you bought a TV in the past 10 years, it's most likely LEDs. The atomic clock. Atomic clock is purely quantum mechanical. Why do we care about atomic clock? My watch is pretty good. I've been relying on the atomic clock ever since I landed in Denver. GPS. The GPS relies on very, very precise clock on the constellation of satellite around the world to tell you where you are. And to do that, you need a highly, highly precise clock. The more precise your clock is, the more precision you have on Earth. So GPS, every time you use your GPS, think of it, quantum mechanics. MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging. The real word for it is actually nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. We look at the behavior of the nuclei in the, in the hydrogen atom in the water in your body. We don't call it nuclear MRI anymore because people were kind of freaking out <laughs> when you say, hey, I'm going to put your head in a nuclear machine. Okay? So nuclear here refers to the nuclei of, of atoms. We don't do fission. We don't do fusion. We don't make bombs. It's all good. The transistor, transistor as we know it, again, behave, the, way, the reason why the transistor works is because of quantum mechanics. None of those technologies really harness quantum effects to its core to build technology, but they all exist because the world is quantum mechanical. Now let me take a little step back. Another type of technology, actually pretty much the only type of technology we've been using today is these type of gadgets. Cell phone, computers, printer, camera, everything that we call digital. At their core, all those nice little gizmo, they do the same thing. They manipulate information. We call them digital because they're binary, on, off. Okay? Of course, the task they do is very different, but at their core, at their microchip, all they do is they have bits of zeros and ones, they flip them around, they, they push them around, and they do something with it. So the bit, all our technology is designed with bits, zeros or one, the simplest alphabet you can think of. We all speak English here, some of us a little less, but we all speak English, 26 letters. You don't need 26 letters to build an alphabet, you need two, zero and one. So the simplest thing. So that's what the bit is. Way back in the days, the bit was a vacuum tube. It was clunky. It was about this big. Okay, I wanted to bring mine, but I figured it might break in the plane, and I like mine, so I don't want to break it. The first computer was built with 17,000 of those things, and it was less powerful than your watch. It was called the ANIAC in 1947, maybe 46. And then they found a way, because a transistor, really, the only thing it does, well, the vacuum tube here, it's a switch. Okay? It, it, it takes an electrical current, and according to some control, it switches the, cur the current one way or the other way. Zero, one. And then your processor just deals with the zeros and ones. Then they found a way to do it in solid state. So we're using a piece of metal, or a piece of material. So it was much smaller. And then using integrated circuit, which got even more... No, much more small. And actually the transistor for the past 60 years, 70 years, have been reducing in size by a factor of two every 18 months or so. Think about it, a factor of two every 18 months for the past 60 years. This is the modern equivalent of building pyramids. This is an astonishing engineering feat. But look at that now, 22 nanometer. 22 nanometer, to give you a, a perspective, take one of your hair, if you have some. <laughs> slice it in 100,000. That's 22 nanometer. Okay? The transistors that I have in my computer, they're this size. The first computer, like in the, uh, sorry, the first transistor was about the size of my thumb, my thumbnail. One transistor. Now, the chip in my computer is about the size of my thumbnail. It has about 3 billion of those. It's pretty cool. 22 nanometer, that's also the size of about 300 atoms. What did I say when you start going to the atomic scale? The rules of physics are different. 
but also what will happen? What if we're still able to build a transistor that is the size of one atom? Then what? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> but, no, but really, like, I say today, I say, here's a computer made of transistors that are one, atoms, one, no, one atom thick. Would I be able to build something even smaller? more powerful. No, that's the end of the road. You're done, right? You need to think of something else. Because also there, like a bit you were mentioning, is at that point, the rules of classical physics are no longer there. So it, there's no such thing as zero or one. Everything gets completely mixed up. There's new rules taking over, and engineers right now, they're freaking out. They don't know what to do with it. I mean, they kind of do. They find ways to, to fabricate things so that the quantum effects cancel out each other, but that's not going to last very long. Also, some things I want you to realize, and it was realized by Ralph Landauer in, about in the, the 60s. Right, I've been talking about those nice little gizmo information processing and all this, and I have shown you a bunch of transistors. But ultimately, I can think of information as language manipulating bits, but once you build the technology, it's physical. I build a bit made of material. Materials behave according to the laws of physics because it's in the world. And ultimately, it has to behave according to the laws of quantum mechanics. This is what quantum information theory is. is we, take quantum, we take information theory, as we know it today, quantum mechanics, and we put them together. What if information behave quantum mechanically? Can I do something with this? Well, the answer is obviously yes, because I'm here to talk about it. But that was the spark that started it all. So now we don't talk about bits, but we talk about quantum bits, or qubit for short. A quantum bit, it can be in 0, it can be in 1, it can be in a superposition of 0 and 1 at the same time any kind of superposition of any type of probability amplitude. How do we build this? Well, you need a system that behaves quantum mechanically, that you can control because you, need, you have to be able to harness it, that you can measure, and you want to be able to have a whole bunch of them together that you can process multiple qubits of information. My favorite one is spin. If you don't know what spin is, that's fine. It's not spin like this. It's a little like that, but not quite like that, because then that would be classical. Right? Every single elementary particle, electron, proton, neutron, have a mass, they have a size, they have a charge, but they also have another property called spin, which is a little bit like their own magnetic moment. They're kind of a tiny bar magnet. So that's intrinsic. And that little bar magnet, when you put it in the magnetic field, it can point up or down. That's it. Unlike a magnet, a bar magnet that you can point in any direction, no. A spin can only point in two, spin one half. If there's physicists in the room, I don't want to say things wrong. A spin one half can, spin, can point in only two directions, up or down. What is quantum mechanical? So you can do a superposition of those. Do you have a question? No, I was going to No, OK. Um, yeah, so, and, and we can use spin, electron spin or nuclear spin, they're very well behaved, and we can use them to do quantum computation. Trapped ions. You have an ion, an ion is an atom that's missing a few electrons. You can use that as your qubit. Your electron is in a low energy state that we call ground state, or in an excited energy state, so higher energy, and you can manipulate that and put it in superposition. Actually, trapped ion is very, very hot in Colorado. A place called Boulder, National Institute for Standard and Technology. There's a guy called Dave Weinland who won the Nobel Prize just last year. He's a top-notch guy in trapped ion. Superconducting qubit. Those are actually, they're not atoms or molecules, but they're actually man-made electrical circuit, very small. They're, very, they're, they're no, micrometer or nanometer small. 
but they're made of millions and millions of atoms, but yet we can make them behave quantum mechanically. We can make the electrical current around this loop go one way, or the other way, or both. One way is zero, the other way is one, both is a superposition. Quantum optics, the photon. I've been talking about the photon. Photon is a great example of a quantum system. Trapped atom, quantum dot, so on and so forth. So right now, there's about half a dozen serious candidates for a good quantum bit. Now, what can we do with quantum bit? Well, there's many things, but we break it in, pre, in, in three categories. There's the idea of quantum computing. So building a computer that will work uniquely according to quantum mechanics that help us, well, do what a computer do, which is compute. People forget that. Okay? Computers are not good for Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, you can do that. But at the core, the only thing a computer do is compute. It solves mathematical problem, adds number, and then it turns it into a YouTube video or Angry Birds or whatever. <laughs> We can use quantum mechanics for quantum communication to make ultra-secure communication, unbreakable sec information security. We can also use quantum, uh, quantum bits to make classical communication more robust, more effective. We can build a quantum internet that's way down the road. Quantum sensors. I'm going to talk about that later. Also, quantum materials, which are new type of material, new phases of material. This I'm not going to talk about because I'm not an expert. It's just go on Wikipedia. So, quantum computing. Before going into the details of quantum computing, let me talk about traditional computing. This is the only computer, computer you ever need. I know it doesn't look much, right? This is called a Turing machine. In 1930-something, Alan Turing, an absolute genius of the 20th century, even before a computer existed, he was actually doing an, an intellectual exercise saying, what if I can build a, compu a computer, a machine that can compute? And then he went on to study what could be done and could not be done, and so on and so forth. So he designed this machine. So actually, by the way, that until about three years ago when somebody actually built it, that was just a thought experiment. Okay? It was never been built because it's an absolute useless machine. <laughs> but this is the Turing machine. It has an infinitely long tape. It has a pen. It can write zero, one. It can erase. The tape can go back and forth, and it can take commands, an algorithm. Okay? What he showed is every possible machine that would compute, anything that you can build in any possible way that can compute, can be simulated by this machine. So what he showed is if you can build a machine that solve a certain problem, this machine can do it too. So this is a universal computer, as we call it. Not only this, a little later with his friend Church, he showed that if a problem, if you can build a machine that solve a problem easily, I'm not going to explain what I mean by easily and hard. Well, easily means in no time and hard means in a lot of time. <laughs> if you can build a machine that can solve any problem easily, this machine can solve it easily too. And if this machine is not able to solve a given problem easily, so a problem is hard on this machine, then there exists no computer who can, be, who can solve that problem easily. So this is a universal machine. Now I start looking like something else, but... So what we call the Turing machine. The impact of this means that every single computer you ever know own and will ever own is the same thing. That fancy laptop here and the abacus, same thing. This farm of computer, those supercomputers and the abacus, same thing. The computer has not become more powerful. They, has, they have become faster, but not more powerful. And the distinction, the distinction is that 
faster mean if I, sorry, if I needed, let's say, a billion operation to solve a, a given problem with the abacus, I still need a billion operation to solve it with my computer farm. It's just that those billion operation, I do them much faster, but it's not more, more powerful. So it means that if a problem is extremely hard on the abacus, it will be extremely hard on a supercomputer. But Richard Feynman, also arguably one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, he had an observation around 1982. Back when he was working at Los Alamos during the World War II, he was in charge of the theory division. So his job was to have a bunch of people trying to solve Schrodinger equation and trying to understand how you can do fission and build an atomic bomb, and well, it was wartime, so you had to do what you had to do. But if, so what turns out, quantum mechanics is insanely hard to simulate. We can simulate the hydrogen atom on a piece of paper. I can do it right on the board. The helium atom, which is just a couple more particles, becomes already very hard. The lithium atom, you probably have to give up already. So try to simulate plutonium, which is like 230 whatever. So he came up with a model. He says, what if I have a, 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 no, a system that behave according to the laws of quantum mechanics? It appears that I would be able to simulate another quantum system easily. So he kind of thought of a, of a way to build a machine that will solve a very, very hard problem, but easily. So it turns out what happened is Alan Turing, when he was looking at, his, at, at the, those computation machines, he forgot about quantum mechanics. He never thought about manipulating information using superposition principle and uncertainty principle. And Richard Feynman kind of laid down the foundation. It took another about 10, 15 years to actually have a proof that yes, actually, if I build a computer that works according to the laws of quantum mechanics, I can build an exponentially faster computing machine. Sorry, exponentially more powerful machine. And let me give you a little sense of how it, how it comes to be. I'm not gonna explain how a quantum computer works because then we're really gonna be here until midnight. But I'm gonna give you a little sense. So let's say I have one quantum bit. If I have one quantum bit, I can be in two states at once, zero and one, as opposed to a classical bit where you can only be in one state, zero or one, but just one at a time. So if I have two quantum bits, I can be in zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, at the same time, four. I need four numbers to explain that. Two classical bit, it's two numbers. If I have three quantum bits, I can be in zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. There's eight possibilities. If I go to four quantum bits, there's 16. Five, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 248. This grows exponentially. With 10 quantum bits, I have the equivalent of about 1,000 bits. That's a kilobyte computer. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us remember. <laughs> if I have 20 quantum bits, just 20 molecules or photons that I can manipulate, that's the equivalent of a, a megabit computer. Oh, now we're back in the 80s. If I have 30, that's a gigabit. That's a computer I'm using right now. 40, that's a terabit computer. That's a supercomputer. With 50 quantum bits, it's a petabit. That's more computational power than all computers on Earth working together with only 50 quantum bits. Now, tell me that's not something worth looking into, OK? <laughs> But now here, word of warning, this is definitely not the whole story. It's an oversimplification. Things are more complex than this. But that gives you a sense of the exponential growth of things we can do. 
I'm going to push, the, push it to the limit. Let's say I build a computer with three, about 300 and not even 250 quantum bit. That computer is potentially more powerful than if I was building a supercomputer made of all the atom in the universe. This is the potential of quantum computing. Now I'm going to mention again, is the quantum computer always more powerful? No. There are problems where the quantum computer does not give you anything. It's always as powerful, but not always more powerful. But there's already many, many, many places where we know it's more powerful. What we call quantum simulation, simulating quantum system. That's extremely important for technology. And that's extremely important for all of us because you can, divide, you can start doing better material science. Why don't we have high temperature superconductors that could transfer electricity at no cost? Because we don't know how they work because we, don't, we cannot simulate them. Drug design. Why do drugs always have side effects? It's because we don't know how to design drugs, right? Drug, you no, know, pharmacology, it's a science, but it's a kind of trial and error based science because we cannot simulate how a molecule would interact with another molecule to make sure that it does the right thing. We cannot build them from the ground up. Being able to do quantum simulation would allow us to do drugs from the ground up. It can also be applied to optimization problem, artificial intelligence, big data, Google search. It can speed up Google search by quite, quite a bit. And who knows? Those are places where we know it has an application. There's lots of places where we still don't know if it's more powerful or not. So the, the jury's still out. It's still a very young field. But only for those, it will already have a massive, massive impact on the way we, we live and the kind of technology we can build. So the quantum computer, before you ask the question, well, would I have a quantum computer on my desktop? I don't know. Not tomorrow. Not in five years. <coughs> okay? We have prototypes. They are prototypes. Like right now, the, the, the largest one is about 12 quantum bits that was fully controlled. There's some people that can dabble with about 20 quantum bits, but it's not perfectly controlled yet. So we're still learning how to talk with atoms and molecules. It's very, very hard. But the field is moving much faster than we anticipated. Ten years ago, we thought it would be about 50 years down the road. Now we think maybe 15, 20 years might not be a crazy <laughs> idea of having a large-scale quantum computer. But a few years down the road. Now I'm going to switch to something else. That was quantum computing. Now I'm going to switch to quantum cryptography, another type of subject where quantum mechanics can be very useful. Alice and Bob, <laughs> be friends with them. When we talk about communication, we always talk about sending information between A and B. A and B is kind of boring, so we call them Alice and Bob. And I like to put a nice little face to them. So Alice Cooper, Bob, Bob Dylan. So, what is quantum cryptography? Or what is cryptography? Cryptography is the science of sending messages or keeping messages in an encrypted way so that an untrusted person cannot have access to the information. When you sign, log into your bank account, when you sign into your Facebook, or when you want to hide messages from somebody. <laughs> Typically, what's, go what's going on on the web or at the bank is kind of the mathematical equivalent of this. Imagine Alice and Bob both share a key, like literally just a key, mathematical equivalent of a key, but they have the same one. Alice wants to send a message, or what she does, she puts it in the uh, safe, locks it, send the safe to Bob, Bob has the key, unlock it, you got the message. The only way you can break it in the middle is that if you can crack the safe, okay? which normally we assume that is good enough. But the problem is, how do you exchange that key? How do you get that key from Alice to Bob? Well, the easiest way is for Alice and Bob to meet each other, exchange the key, and then go. But then what's the point? They can just exchange the message. <laughs> then you can say, well, they can meet once, and then exchange a 1,000 key, 
and then go and then decide on which key at what time. He's like, yeah, fair enough. But in the meantime, you know, I can sneak up on, uh, you know, at Bob's place, take the bag of key, copy them, put them back. He will never know. So, and nowadays, that's a bit what's happening. Okay? The, the, the one secure way of doing communication is using as a key a completely random strings of zeros and ones. If you have a completely random strings of zeros and ones, you can communicate information such that it's completely impossible to crack that kind of information unless you have access to the key. So nowadays, when governments or, or companies want to talk with each other in an ultra-secure way, they get somebody, secret service, guy for hire, then they go with a suitcase, handcuffed to their, uh, to, to, to their wrist, and they go and they meet, uh, you know, they meet each other, they do the exchange, and they come back just to exchange the key. Well, there's a serious problem with that. You have to be sure that you can trust the guy and that he cannot be bought. That's a very heavy assumption. That's an assumption you don't want to make. But, you know, sometimes people do that. But my bottom, point, bottom line is, this is safe, it's very impractical. So nowadays, we don't really use this. Instead, we use mathematical tricks. In order to exchange that key, cryptography that we have on the web, have you ever noticed when you log in to any website that you have to type in your password, HTTP in the top, change to HTTPS? If you haven't noticed that, go home, log into your email, and, and, and figure it out. So that means that at that point, all the informations are secure, which means that in the background, there's, there's uh, something happening such that in order to have access to the key or to decrypt the message, you have to solve a very, 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 very hard mathematical problem. That's how cryptography is based today. What type of problem? Well, the, the, the one that is used the most is what we call the RSA that you may have heard about. It's like, it's everywhere on the web. It's, it's prevalent everywhere. The RSA is based on the fact that we are not able to factor numbers. Factoring numbers is the reverse of multiplication. If I give you five and three, you multiply them and give me 15. That's multiplying. If I give you 15, then you give me back five and three. That's factoring. For 15, it's easy. For 143, it's easy too. If I give you a number that is 200 digit long, that takes about a thousand years for the best computer. And if I was giving you one that is two, uh, no, 201 digit long, that would be 200 year, uh, 2,000 years, and then 4,000 years. Like, it's a problem that grows exponentially hard as the size of the problem. This is what we rely on today. We assume that nobody have a thousand year to crack your emails or your bank account. But you have to assume that nobody has found a really good algorithm that could crack it or that has built a very powerful computer, <coughs> quantum computer. Quantum computer could crack, could solve the factorization problem like this. Okay? So of course now at that point, you know, it's like, well, why are you guys building a quantum computer? It's like, well, we want to crack the internet. Of course, that's why we build it. Of course not. But it shows also how powerful a quantum computer can be. But thankfully, we can use quantum mechanics to actually generate this key using no computational assumption whatsoever, based solely on the laws of physics. And trust me, you cannot crack the laws of physics. I'm a physicist. Trust me. Unless you can change the laws of nature, which you can't. So security now will go from computationally secure to physically secure. And I will go in the exact details of how to do it. So when you leave tonight, you will know exactly how quantum cryptography works. <laughs> but first of all, I have to introduce this box. As I said, I cannot give you a mental picture of how superposition work. The only thing I can, the, the only thing I can bring to you is the consequences of superposition. 
So this box is, is a special box, and it has rules. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a 0 or a 1. So this is my bit. Okay? Again, remember, that key that we tried to share is we're only trying to share something completely random, a strings of zeros and ones that are random. So just for fun, I'll, I'll pick 0. Now, the way the box works is if I put my 0 using the first door, door number 1, and I take out the bit using the same door, I will always have the same bit. So if I look at the door that was put in, I always get the same bit. But if I will actually look at the second door, I would get a completely random bit. Why? Quantum mechanics. Now we'll have to go in the lab to explain. But that's essentially how quantum mechanics works. Similarly, if I take my zero and I put it in the second door, as long as I look at the second door, I'll see zero all the time. But if I look at the complementary door, I'll get something completely random. Sometimes zero, sometimes one. Do we understand the rule in the game? <laughs> Do I need to go over it again? <laughs> okay. Bottom line, you, re you open the same door it was put in, you get the, the right answer. You open the other door, you get something random. Now, that's what we're going to do. Alice will decide of a bit, randomly, flip a coin, decide heads or tails, zero, one. And she will also decide randomly in which door she's going to put it in. So let's say for that one, she puts it in door number one. She's going to send that to Bob. That's the quantum bit. And Bob, with, without ever talking to Alice, he will choose on this side, randomly, which door he's going to look at. If you choose the correct door, great, he's got the right bit. If you choose the wrong door, he doesn't. Well, he will get something random. So Alice, that's what she's going to do. She's going to, she's going to decide of a strings of zeros and ones to send, completely random. And at the same time, she will decide which door each bit is going to go in, completely random. Send all those things to Bob. And Bob, again, is going to look at door at random. And he will measure something. OK, here the color, just so you follow. The number is the bit. The color is in which door is gone. In. Now let's analyze each bit. For the first bit, Alice put it in door number one. But Bob opened door number two. So at that point, Alice and Bob will not necessarily have the same thing. So what they do is at that point, they pick up the phone or they talk over the internet, they don't say what they measured and what they sent. They just say how they sent it. Alice will say, I put it, I don't tell you what, but I put it in the door number one. And Bob says, well, I measured no door number two. OK, let's discard it. So they toss it in the garbage. Then they're going to do that for the next one. Well, Alice says, I put it in door number one. Bob said, I, I looked at door number one. Then let's keep it. And they're going to do that over, over and over again for all of those. Now, if you notice, at that point, they have the exact same key. Wow, well, that's nothing. You haven't seen anything. Whoa. <laughs> now it's easy. There was, no, there was no bad guy in the middle. So they could just have picked up the phone. Now we have to consider Eve. <laughs> The eavesdropper. <laughs> By the way, this is real language. We really use those names in actual scientific <laughs> literature. So what Eve really, like there's many techniques she can do, but the best she can do is intercept, read, and send again. Okay, there's other techniques, but we're going to look at that one. So again, Alice sent it in door number one. So from now on, we're just going to consider when Alice and Bob read at this, in, no, open the same door, because all the other ones would be tossed out. So it gets intercepted by Eve. Well, Eve doesn't know what Alice did, doesn't know what Bob will do. So the best she can do is randomly open a door. Half the time, she will open the right door, measure the right bit, put back the right, put back the right bit in, send it to Bob, and Bob measure the right bit, undetected. But the other half of the time, 
she will open the wrong door. So measure the uh, a random bit that she will put back inside. But now, that's where it plays. That's where the uncertainty principle come in. She gets something random, zero or one. So it does not matter if she put it back in door number two or door number one. She put back something random. So she completely messed up what Alice put in. So when Bomb measures it, even though he opens a right door, he gets a random bit. This is quantum mechanics at work for information security. So what happened is, if you look again at that string, is about a quarter, about a half the time, just the fact that Eve was there, she introduced an error in the string. And the possibility of that error happening is about a quarter. A typical key is about a million bit long. A quarter times a quarter times a quarter times a quarter, a million times, that's zero. So the probability that Eve picked up all the right key without disturbing it is null. So now, then when Alice and Baum has those million bit, what they will do is they just take a little chunk of it and then they will compare it over the phone. Here's that little chunk. Do we have the same thing? No? Huh. Alice is in the middle. Let's not talk because it's not secure. Do we have the same bit, the, the same string? Yes? Okay, now we can talk and we're secure. So they just use a little part that then they toss away, but they know that all the rest they have is the exact same one and nobody else has that information. So then they can just encrypt the email, send it over the internet, decrypt it. So we call it quantum cryptography, but it's really is quantum enabled cryptography. Okay? It's classical cryptography, it's just encrypting information, but we use quantum mechanics to make it possible. This is not fiction. This technology exists today. If you have a hundred and twenty something thousand dollar, you can buy your own link of quantum cryptography. There's a handful of companies out there that sells stable, right of the box quantum cryptography system. There's also networks, like research networks, but the first one was in, Bo in Boston area in 2004. It's already 10 years ago. They had a place where there was 10 nodes doing quantum cryptography between each other. Uh, European had a network in 2008. The Japanese has one still running. Actually, one of the latest one has been used in real life setting for securizing the electric grid. Information security is extremely important on the electric grid because what's happening there and what's happening there if somebody messes up the phase of the current at one place, you can take down, you can literally take down the grid. So they've shown that they can do, that they can secure a, a, an experimental research uh, electric grid, but electric grid nonetheless, using quantum cryptography. That was done by Los Alamos people, but I think the grid was in Chicago or something like that. One of the problem now is quantum cryptography is very limited in range, because we use single photon. And the single photon that leaves has to be the one that arrives. I'll spare you the detail of why, but take it for granted. Single photon get absorbed, whether by the atmosphere or if it's in an optical fiber, they get absorbed by the fiber. So for example, if I was to set a cryptography link here in Buena Vista, by the way, I'm sorry, I forget that you guys talk mileage. I talk kilometers. But it's in my quest to actually convince Americans to go to the metric system. <laughs> it's my little effort. So you're stuck to about 100 kilometers, 60 miles. If you're really, really, really good, you can go to about 90 miles. But what if, if no, so you can go to Denver, it's great. But what if you want to talk with New York or, or China or Australia? Well, there's different models. Another way that we take at the University of Waterloo at IQC, but it's done also by some group in the United States, some people in, Ger in, uh, in England, Europe, the Europeans have also a project, the Chinese has a project, 
is to go global distances using satellites. So we are trying to actually exchange keys of quantum signal between a ground station with a satellite, then that satellite can go anywhere in the world, anywhere around, and exchange another key, which effectively makes those two places linked. With a and this is sort of a video of our effort. Like, all the proof of principle have been done. That pickup truck here, that's our simulator for a satellite. There's actually a telescope mounted on it that follows the beam, and then you can do a key exchange, and the truck goes at about uh, 10 miles an hour. So it's, eight, it's 800 meters far from the ground station, goes at 10 miles an hour, which is roughly the equivalent of a satellite passing on top of you, which is 800 kilometers far and going at 12,000 kilometers an hour. So we can simulate that. And now really we're three to five years away from launching satellites that will start doing quantum cryptography on a global scale. And I'll talk really quickly about quantum sensors. Because I'm pushing, oh yeah, I'm, I'm pushing your bedtime. <laughs> quantum sensors, it's my bedtime too. <laughs> so we've seen that we can use, that we can use quantum mechanics for doing ultra powerful computing, ultra secure cryptography, but we can do also ultra secure sense, uh, ultra secure, ultra precise or ultra effective sensing. Sensors are everywhere. This is a sensor. Your car is chock full of sensors. Your fridge has sensors. Your house has sensors. An MRI machine is a sensor. What if I can build sensors that work only on quantum mechanics? Remember, quantum mechanics is the ultimate description of nature. So that means that I will be able to do sensors that, are, that have the greatest precision or the greatest sensitivity, the greatest selectivity, the greatest efficiency, or the greatest robustness allowed by nature. So that's the promise of it. Some example, magnetic sensing. Sensing magnetic field is very, very nice, especially in biochemistry or in chemistry or in material science. Because looking at something just gives you one information, is the shape. When you're trying to look how things behave to build better and better technologies, better and better sensors, you want to know how they behave, but also how they interact with the environment. How the electric field and the electric field um, you know, behave. I'll give you an example of what we can do. Here you see 10 spins, but it's not 10 spins, it's 5 spins. And I can take my five spins, five, five electrons or, or five atoms, put them all pointing up and all pointing down at the same time. That's called quantum entanglement. Now I'll grab one of those and I'll go in the next room or figure a speech. I'll go somewhere else and make it interact with a, many, a very small magnetic field. So because I have one particle, I can bring it very, very, very close to, I don't know, a cell, another atom, or whatever, and it's gonna interact. Then I bring it back to my five other ones. Now you see here, it's like they're all up or they are all down. When I make it interact with my other thing that I'm trying to sense, it's gonna effectively measure if it's up or down. So if it measures that this guy here is pointing up, then automatically it means that all of mine are pointing up. If it points down, then all of mine are pointing down. So it's a way to amplify the signal of one atom to a whole bunch of other atoms. And what, allow, what that allows me to do is it allows me to sense very, very, very weak signal. Here an example. If I just use I won't go into the detail, but the important thing is the difference between the low and the high. That tells me how much I can read. If I use one spin, I can read that much. Five spin, much better. Ten spin, much, much better. Okay? But still, at the end of the day, I only use one spin, one tiny detector, brought it somewhere to measure, bring it back, and I amplify the signal. That's something you cannot do classically. So that's an example. What can you do with this? And it goes on. 
You can do things like magnetic resonance force microscopy. Have you ever seen those nice images like of electron microscope, of tiny, tiny little thing, and they say, oh, this is like 100 nanometers big. This is great. That doesn't tell us anything. It just tells us how pretty it looks. It doesn't tell us how it behaves. When we build a transistor, who cares what the transistor looks like? We just want to make sure that it works like it's supposed to work. But we cannot do that now because we have no ways of sensing the magnetic field and the electric field. By integrating that kind of technology that I just mentioned with a typical force microscopy now, not only can we get the shape, we can also get its chemical behavior. Ultimately, think of it as a, an MRI machine with atomic precision. We're not quite there yet. But that little thing here can sense things that are about 10 atoms thick, 10 atoms big. So we're almost there. Yes? Could you sense another atom spin? Yes, we can. It's very, very hard, but you can in certain settings. You can measure a single electron spin, but not a single nuclei spin, because the nuclei is about 1,000 times weaker. But this is actually, if you can figure it out, it's probably a Nobel Prize right there. It's a very, very important, pro uh, it's a very important thing that we still haven't, go for it. Man. <laughs> Other things we can do, we can make quantum tops, a spin behave a little bit like a top. If I have seven of them, I can make it spin like one that's just spin seven times faster. So I can make faster clock by not really doing anything more, just by manipulating their quantum state. Another example we can do, is we can use techniques that we developed in quantum information to deal with errors to apply that to completely different type of technology like neutron interferometry. Neutron interferometry is very useful for measuring the structure of atoms, measure, uh, you know, figuring out what's going on in the fuel cell, uh, measuring the, the, the correlatus force in, in certain material and so on and so forth. By applying quantum information technique to this, We've increased the signal-to-noise ratio, i.e. the quality of that thing, by a factor of 600. People kill for a factor of two. <laughs> and within about five years of work, it went 600 times better. This is one example. There's many, many other places where quantum sensors are currently being either developed or used. Glucose detection for diabetic people. You know, you don't need to know the glucose in the blood. That's not what you need to know. You need to know the glucose concentration in tissue. And this is very weak. So we can use quantum sensors to do that. Oil exploration. Right now, there are quantum sensors, quantum information sensors being used in oil well to detect oil at the moment. Personalized medicine, biochemistry, even landmine detection and many other places. So, I'm tired. <laughs> Essentially what I want you to go home with tonight is quantum information is radically a new breed of technology. It works on different principles. It works on different efficiencies. We still haven't figured out everything, but what we've figured out so far is really worth the right. It really harnessed nature at its core, and we truly believe that just like information technology was the driver, the economical driver, and the job creation place of the, of the 20th century, we truly believe that quantum technology is the next step into this. We're not talking about a small little industry. We're hoping that it will be an industry that would just lead you know, into every sphere of life. And also, it's pretty damn cool. <laughs> So thank you very much.